Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, What's Happening with Human Rights Around the World. It's an honor today to welcome two amazing advocates and educators as we look at Hawaii joining the global education ohana and education for sustainable development now. What's so exciting is United Nations University Regional Centers of Expertise Hawaii was just designated as the newest member of the global movement of education for sustainable development. The Ubuntu Committee in Tokyo designated Hawaii on International Human Rights Day recognizing the contribution of Hawaii, both popular and traditional education for UN sustainable development goals. What's so exciting though, is on International Day of Education, Hawaii got the great news. We're here joined with two educators who are gonna share with us today, what is a UNU or United Nations University Regional Center of Expertise? And more importantly, more about education and sustainable development. Brittany, Brian, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. Brittany, can you share a little bit about education in general, why it's so crucial and important, and also about sustainable development and how those two come together under this exciting global initiative? Exactly, yes. So <clears throat> ESD, Education for Sustainable Development, allows all of us to acquire the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values that are necessary to help um, give us this very sustainable future. Um, it also requires participant participatory teaching, which is something at our UN location, especially Brian and I engage in, which is mostly focused on conflict prevention and um, creative problem solving. And what's nice about ESD is it really empowers learners to change their behavior and take action for sustainable development. Um, it can include things such as critical thinking, um, imagining a, a brighter future and making decisions in a very collaborative way. Um, what's also nice about education for sustainable development is that sustainable development can encompass a variety of different things. Uh, we can think of sustainable development in terms of natural resources. You can think of it in terms of um, maybe sustaining our education, having a, you know a consistent quality education and making sure that the same is given for all. Um, but ESD can really, relate to all of our 17 sustainable development goals. Um, and that's something that Brian and I are constantly working on at our RCE location. And we're really happy that you now have an RCE location and we can partner up and do things as well. Thank you so much, Brian. Would you like to add to that about education for sustainable development? Yeah, uh, the Americas Network, which is Central, South and North America. And by the way, congratulations for being the number nine uh, U.S. RCE uh, in the family. What we do is we gather information, we learn from one another. So there might be indigenous ingenuity going on in Central and South America that is not only sustainable, but it's been going on for thousands of years and something that we may have been doing a long time ago, but have forgotten. So people share these ideas. And, and the nice thing about you know creativity and whatnot is it doesn't have to be high tech uh, the simplest solutions to the most complex problems are typically the ones you should go to first. And oftentimes we forget to do that. So ESD is saying, hey guys, there's, there's actually some elegant ways to approach our future. And the other thing about ESDs is, you know, you know the network in Hawaii, so you've got a lot of resources at your disposal. Well, now you've got the entire world because there's about 180 locations worldwide. So when we think about the future and we're going into, uh, you know, scenario building or forecasting and backcasting and all other stuff looking at futures, we can see how different parts of the world are looking at their futures and then our global future. Um, and it's nice to see that uh, there's a lot of common ground. There's like these concentric circles. And what we're trying to do is find where the common ground is and build it out and build it out and build it out. It's fun. It's fun. Oh, it's a big picture. That's a, that's a great point. And exactly, that was actually the focus for UNURC Hawaii Moana Nui Akea we were creating a deeper culture dedicated to sustain uh, sustainability with the nature at the center of our island philosophy, policies, and practices to protect our common future. And we're thinking of it as a haupu'u fern uh, growing in our beautiful islands. And haupu'u is the indigenous Hawaii tree fern native to our lands. And it's threatened species found mainly on Moko Keawe on Hawaii Island around Hawaii Volcano National Park. But that haupu'u fern illustrates the intersectionality of our ideas, initiatives, and institutions. And that was the entire point too rooted in indigenous intuition. And so I'm really glad you brought that up, Brian. That's a really excellent point. And 
when we look at the sustainable development goals, I think it's something most people don't know. I mean, if we look at them, it's number one, ending poverty, number two, zero hunger, three, good health and well being, four, quality education, especially I know we all love 4.7 on global, five, gender equality and gender justice, six, clean water and sanitation, seven, renewable energy, eight, decent work and economic growth, nine, innovation and infrastructure, and 10, reducing inequalities and inequity, where I'll dedicate to that. But then 11 is exciting with that sustainable communities and cities, as well as 12, our own personal behavior, right? Responsible consumption and production. And then for Hawaii, as well as for everyone these days, climate action. 13, 14 is life below water and 15 is life on land. 16, peace, justice, strong institutions. And 17 is exactly the essence of UNURC is that partnerships are able to forge together. Can you maybe explain a little bit about how the SDGs came about and which UN agencies maybe are really focusing on education and sustainability and have that global mandate? Because most people think of the UN as this monolith building right there on, in New York, but there's so many UN agencies dedicated to so many different aspects. Brittany? The SDGs were developed um, at our UN Conference on Sustainable Development. Uh, this was a conference that was actually held in Rio in 2012. Uh, it also uh, leads from our Millennium Development Goals that we had prior. And the purpose of these goals were essentially to create a set of um, global goals that relate to the environment, they relate to um, political challenges, but also economic challenges that we face as an entirety um, for all of humanity. And what's interesting about the United Nations is that we have these goals and you know, whether or not you, know, you wanna see them as setting ourselves up for failure, um, but it's very, it's very progressive thinking and it's, it's taking care of the world. And, um, but they, it's something that creates world leaders. It creates Nobel Peace Prize laureates. Um, it helps ex expand our United Nations as well. Uh, a lot of people like Joshua said, they think of, when they think of the UN, they think of UN headquarters in New York, but they don't realize that there's so many different levels of the United Nations, especially at, they can be within nonprofits, they can be found within universities. We have various organs of the United Nations. Uh, we have UNITAR, UNICEF, uh, UNESCO. Uh, and even, even a lot of these organs that exist or organ, organizations, I would call them more so, a lot of them, um, have different things embedded within them. Like UNITAR has CFAL and CFAL and UNITAR, even though they, they talk together, they operate very differently. Uh, can you so there, explain the acronym for some? Because I know we run around in the UN world and most yeah. people are like, what is UNITAR? Is that something I, I wear with my Lululemons? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like, yes. Um, so UNITAR is United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Um, we also have uh, UNDP, United Nations Development Program. There's, there's so many out there. And then we also have these RCE locations, as you know. Um, mm -hmm. which are regional centers of expertise. Thank you. Some of these, some of these, uh, some of these UN sustainable goals are, have been championed by particular people. Uh, Brittany, uh, you want to say anything about Charles Hopkins or, or am I putting you on the spot? Because no, he's, you go ahead. Well, he's, he's uh, a UNESCO chair and he's been with UN and uh, RCE. Gosh, he's been with UNESCO and RCE for um, quite some time and his work, um, has led to some of these, well, at least one of the uh, sustainable development goals. So it's not like it just came out of a committee and people sitting behind desks and whatnot. It's people out in the field. And when I think of the UN, there is that stereotype about people with desks and, and slow bureaucracy and governments and fighting and two-headed monster and, and New York City and whatnot. But really the UN is people uh, out in small villages and throughout the world doing things <clears throat> using indigenous ingenuity in, in India, it's called Jugad, uh, coming up with really crafty solutions. And it reminds me of, um, you know, if you got some junk in your backyard and you got an idea, you're an inventor. And a lot of the things that lead to um, people meeting 21st century needs without the advantage of, say, some of the first world technology, their ingenuity is what's leading to sustainable uh, development, but without all the 
uh, garbage that goes along with it. So literally they find creative ways to do it. And, and I think that really is, should be the face of the UN, you know, in the future. What, young people figuring out, so for instance, like how do, you, how do you harvest water in a desert region? And you go out and you realize this technology has been around since, you know, before Petra. And how is it they can harvest several hundred gallons of water a night without really doing it, or several thousand gallons when they're really trying, or during the rainy season, several million gallons. How do you get 20,000 people to, to live in a place that gets less than one inch of rain uh, on an annual basis? Because they figure it out to work with nature, not against it. So they dance with nature. And, and the more we go back to that kind of thinking and we get this sort of creativity going, the more we can see that there's a lot of elegant, simple ways for education, for sustainable development to occur. And it's not just textbook stuff. It's, it's going out and remembering what our forefathers and mothers may have done before us yeah. or going to other parts of the world and seeing how it's done and bringing it back home we we are we should be exporting ingenious ingenuity from other parts of the world bringing it back here and it and to some, kind of simplify things in a sense i mean look no i'm not trying to uh poo poo um some of the advances we've had with being able to grow crops to keep millions of people, hundreds of millions of people alive and, and um, nourished. There's been some ma you know, man uh, fantastic advances. I mean, one, one gentleman is, is credited with saving several hundred million uh, people in India for his, his uh, natural breeding technique for wheat in Mexico. That's fantastic. But there's other things we could be doing just to kind of keep it simple. And I think if the more we think about that, the better off we're gonna be I'm, I'm getting kind of old and I see these people come up with these really complex protocols and stuff. It's kind of like, isn't, is there just a simpler way to do it? Yeah. And, and if it's simpler, more people can repeat it or modify it. You make something so incredibly complex, it's gonna be hard to do. It's gonna be hard to teach. It's gonna be hard to transmit. I totally agree. And that gets to really something that Brittany got back to. I really thought what was revolutionary about the global goals was first and foremost, it said, leave no one behind. I thought that was absolutely crucial. Also then heard this behind first, but then what was also a shift, right? From the Millennium Development Goals to the global goals, it wasn't cutting it in half. It was bold enough to say, we'll eliminate it from the planet. And then I really do appreciate, Brian, all the examples you're giving, because when we do think about it, it is more peer to peer and just mm -hmm. people mm -hmm. talking story is probably more transformational then that more complex, larger systems that we've worked in in the past, where we hire consultants and do everything. What I'm excited about the UNURCE, Hawaii, Moana, Nui Akea, is that network of knowledge and mm. being able to exchange and being able to then focus what you were saying, that dance. We started to do that dance for dignity, but also dance for democracy. And in this case, it's earth democracy, as Vandana and Ashiva talked about it, and how we can do that. Maybe you could continue with highlights of various UNURCE activities and, and ingenuity in the Americas, as well as around the world, building on the one example you shared earlier. Can I can I uh, give you one real quick that I, I love it when, when people just come up with brilliant ideas and we'll give you some specific RCE stuff in the Americas, but there's a, a young researcher at Stanford University who was looking at, uh, it's, it's a medical uh, engineer, how is it that we can get, so this is one of the access to healthcare is one of the SGDs and, and how do we make it universal and affordable and approachable and that sort of thing. And what this guy did, uh, well, there's two inventions. One is you need to have a centrifuge, like a, an okidata where you can spin blood into serum and stuff like that to be able to do some uh, hematology analysis. Well, what they did is they, they get a little piece of paper, they put the drop of blood on it, it's got two strings, you pull it like this and it spins. It's just, it's kind of like a kid's toy. Like when I was a kid, we, I had something, like, I don't know what it's called. And then what it does is it, it separates the blood out and then you can take it, put it on a slide and do your analysis. It's kind of like for, for 50 cents. So you don't have an $800 microscope and you don't have to worry about the power supply. That's one thing. And then another thing that this guy came up with for less than a dollar, he, he um, built, a, a microscope and it's, it comes on a piece of paper and you can pull it out and you can have uh, assemble it and it's got a little piece of glass in there to amplify or to to uh, um, for you to be able to look at the, the uh, sample 
and visually verify, oh, this is, you know, we've got malaria here, or we've got something going on. Um, and it's, it's almost as ingenious as like some of these water purified, you know, the straws you can use to, to drink, have potable water. All that kind of stuff saves lives. And, and it's no use doing anything else if people are dying on us from diseases that are easily preventable. And, and by doing these things, by coming up with a $1 or a 28 cent uh, tele, uh, microscope and a uh, 58 cent blood trans, uh, blood, uh, whatever it's called, the, the, the Yoki Yada, the thing they split, that's, that is ingenious. And guess what? It's, it's being exported and it's, it was developed in the field. And they taught people and, and the people in the field saying, hey, this is how you should modify it. This is the way it's going to work. That's, that's, and the networks for doing something like that, the networks of democracy for doing stuff like that is UNURCE locations. And there's there's a ton of them in India, by the way. And there's uh, and there's overabundance, uh, I should say, which is good in India and in Africa. And what we in the Americas can be doing is uh, uh, linking up with those folks and seeing some of this crazy cool stuff that's going on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, Brittany. Is there anything you'd like to add about examples of UNU RCE in the Americas and how sure. we can interact better? So um, I can comment on, um, before I, I came over here to Salisbury and um, put in an application for an RCE location with Brian, I came from RCE Greater Atlanta and I really enjoyed working with them and their director, Jenny, uh, taught me the ropes of RCEs and uh, she kind of inspired, she inspired me to put in an application over here. And what I like about Jenny's location is, you know, they, they work on a variety of um, edu education for sustainable development initiatives, especially focused on environmental reasons. But she also takes, um, she approaches the sustainable development goals from a viewpoint of equity and justice. And that, that viewpoint really builds upon Atlanta's history um, as being home to the civil rights movement. And I think it, it, it was, it's very inspiring because she's created like this new regional model for collective um, impact over there. And she has incorporated um, and really developed a large youth network over there as well. And um, let's see here, another, another example could even be over here, our, our RC location that Brian and I have, um, we also take a similar approach. We not only focus on environmental issues, but if there's a certain like social justice issue as well, we'll work on a project uh, with um, some of our fellows, especially if it involves the Gandhi family. So I, I don't know if Brian, Brian wants to share a little bit about um, Dr. Arun Gandhi, if we have yeah. time. Yeah, it, it doesn't hurt to have a, a guru. <laughs> Arun Gandhi is Mahatma Gandhi's fifth grandchild. He just happens to be like the senior practitioner in the Bosman Center where the RCE is located. And um, Arun takes ideas. He calls himself a peace farmer and does things one at a time. Yeah, yeah. And he's been at it for, he'll be 88 in April. So, it's, you know, a good eight, eight decades. He learned from his grandfather firsthand. And what we'll do is we'll start things maybe like, with uh, seasonal farm workers on the peninsula here and the state legislature and try and find ways that we need people to work um, in agriculture, but at the same time, there's measures of dignity and uh, where do people, children get their education? So how does it, how is it reciprocal? How's it balanced? How is there sort of a, um, an equity aspect to these sorts of things? But we also work on rural health, which if you think about it, United States, it, it seems kind of odd. We've got the world's best health system, especially when it comes to different technologies and all that sort of stuff. But if you look at the um, even distribution of diseases and whatnot, it doesn't exist. And there's a rural aspect to it. There's a, oh, there's a geographic aspect and a class and a racial aspect to these things. And that there's very specific rural health needs that aren't being met by the um, it's not a major agenda item, I should say, on um, United States health agenda. And so we kind of bring these things up and uh, it's, it's, it's shedding light on uh, issues and finding 
uh, local solutions. And so we've had some very good success over the years. One of, one of the people that works with us in the center, uh, she's a fellow, her name is Mitzi Purdue. She Purdue Farms, Purdue Chickens, very intelligent, bright lady. And she started an organization called Healthy U of Delmarva to address specific issues of health in rural communities. And it really shed a lot of light to the point where Johns Hopkins University Medical School said, there's something to this and we should spend some more time and get over here on the peninsula and take a look at it. So there's all sorts of crazy ways to do it. Another one I want to bring up is uh, there are every year we have two conferences. One is the Americas Conference where all the, all the locations get together and we spend a great deal of time uh, basically show and tell. And these really interesting projects that folks are doing. It could be young college students um, in Mexico. It could be people in Canada coming up with different agriculture things, stuff on water, you, you name it. And it's, it's really inspiring because again, they're showing us some of the best stuff, some of the best work they're doing. And over a two day period, you realize there's an incredible amount of good stuff going, but it's like one seed at a time. Well, that's great. And I, I like the idea of peace farming as well. And maybe we could share, and Brittany, you can add as well, the examples, but then also how's the calendar then for, for people around the world trying to engage with this? Is it, uh, when does the Americas meeting happen? When does the global one happen? And then, you know, the exciting part of follow-up. I'll take it, Brittany. Sure, okay. Uh, the Americas meeting of which Brian was just referring to includes um, represent representatives from RCE locations. It's normally the RCE uh, secretariats or their known as directors. And they'll come to these meetings and, um, in the first one, which is the regional one, uh, is the Americas meeting, and that usually is around October. Um, the reason why these are um, made at certain times usually is due to other conferences or something that's going on at UNESCO. Um, and then we have a global one, which usually meets, I would say, uh, in December uh, of each year too. Um, but not every year we've had these meetings or conferences. Um, there's been some years where it's been skipped. Um, they range from being um, in person and also online. Um, but it's a great opportunity where RCEs can come together from all over the world and share what projects they're working on um, and network. And um, just basically, you know, um, also, sh oh, actually, I have no idea what I was going to say there. I'm like Dory the fish from Finding Nemo. But uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's an incredible opportunity where you get to go and meet everybody from all over the world. So we're very fortunate the RCE Service Center, which um, supports our RCEs, helps us uh, bring everyone together and takes care of um, getting us there. So well, we all know with COVID, it's been extremely challenging, of course, to continue yeah. meetings, to, to have those sessions. But one of the it's things that we hard. were thinking about was for UNURC Hawaii, Moana, Nui Akea, we we're so excited to join this global network of fellow activists, advocates, analysts, and artists, of course. And we thought about it. In Africa, from Cairo, Egypt, to KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa, and in Europe, from Vienna, Austria, to Scotland, United Kingdom, we can really reach out and share skills around the UN Paris Agreement, and as you were describing in the Americas, from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, to Georgetown University, United States of America, and in the Asia Pacific, from Tasmania, Australia, all the way to Waikato University and Aotearoa, New Zealand, we can connect on strategies to achieve this UN 2030 agenda of these 17 global goals. So it is exciting, as Brian mm. shared, for talking story, but it's also exciting to see and learn from each other because in a way we're all sort of peace farmers and we're, we're looking for the right seeds that we know will go with our soil that we can plant and we know where we're from, but we also see the commonality of some of the, those challenges. And what I think also that's exciting about you and you RC, that would be great for us to both delve into in our final moments is maybe how it's also traditional education, but also popular education outside the classroom and how really the world is our classroom with you and you RC. Right. Yeah. Hey, most, most of the good stuff that we, we see going on 
with the use, uh, RCE networks is experiential in nature. It's getting your hands dirty. It's kind of interesting you would talk about the right seeds for the right soil because what might be a solution here is not a solution in Uruguay. And so they have to come up with their own solution. And you know, there's parts of the Middle East where they said, oh, the desert cell bloom. And what they did is they literally took plants and trees that were found in Europe and tried to plant them in a desert. It's kind of like, no, that's not, <laughs> it's not the way it works. Uh, and then, uh, as I was saying a little while ago, we have to dance with nature rather than, or, you know, work with it rather than not. I, I think the 2030 uh, number, you know, the, the goals for 2030, um, it won't be achieved, and but, but it's not supposed to be. Uh, but we have to put a number on it somewhere. It's got to be relatively within reach. But this is, these are lifetime and multi-generational questions and solutions and we just get better. And it's a Bayesian kind of thing. It's not like, oh, we find a solution and go on. We just get better and make some uh, adjustments and get better again and get better, 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 better. Um, and so it's, it's, I think we should really reinforce that it's, it's like a, an iterative process, something that we're gonna be continuing to do for a good long time. And that's why relationships like the ones we're forging here are most important. Cause you know, what goes on in Hawaii, we don't know but we're going to learn and maybe there's something really funky creative cool you guys are doing that we can pick up and do over here that sounds great Brittany. any closing comments no, i i have to say that i rces make it feel like we're all part of a global family and ever since you've been introduced as an rce josh you've even come closer to us i feel like even though you're all the way in hawaii so no you and you rc hawaii moana nui kea we consider it also a multicultural multidisciplinary movement dedicated to sustainable development, rooted in collective dignity and human rights for all. And we're hoping we can contribute by bringing together bold thinkers, transformative beauty builders in an inter-island and intergenerational hub for sharing these promising practices to promote rights and protect our planet. And Brian, it's definitely aspirational, but I think it's like human rights. Uh, what we're saying about the global goals, it, it's a floorboard that no one's life should fall below. Right. But also the heaven and the aspiration we aspire towards, mm -hmm. and together we can achieve that only by partnering, and it all begins with education. Yeah, and you know what, we can match those aspirations with um, achievable expectations, institutional expectations, those sorts of things. Um, it you know, uh, I think one of the things we can't do is kill passion, right? Because young people come up with great ideas and passion is just fuel. And I've learned at my age that when they're passionate about something, just get out of the way, they're going to run you over. <laughs> uh, but but we, we can't find uh, every solution tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, we can yeah. work on it in stepwise progression. So I guess maybe the question there is uh, the patience that goes along with good conversation, good action will eventually lead to something and not to rush what we're doing. It's, it's a deliberative process, something we're in it together. Thank you so much. And that's actually the three P's I teach all my students. First is passion, and that's a renewable oh. fuel. Then it's patience, because things just don't happen as quick as we want it to. And we always remember though, as youth, gotta be yesterday. And then right. finally, persistence. So those are the three P's I always share. So it's great we're on the same page. I know we're running out of time, but I wanna thank you on. I think Brian, we wanna add one more P. I don't wanna leave yeah. out. Perseverance. There you go. That goes with passion, persistence, perseverance. There we go. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us and look forward to being part of the UNU RCE Ohana. Maluhia Mekapona. Thanks, Josh. Welcome to Namaste. the gang. <laughs>